So hello, uh, and thank you for uh, inviting uh, me to share this information with you uh, on exercise in adult Refsum's disease. This presentation was prepared uh, jointly between myself and Sarah Furman, uh, who is an uh, adult Refsum's disease dietitian at St. Thomas's Hospital. So I think, first of all, it's quite useful to focus on why it's why exercise can be helpful when you have uh, adult Refsum's disease. So we do know that strength and ba balance training can be beneficial that it can be really helpful in preventing falls, and it can help you to maintain your flexibility and your muscle mass, um, all of which are important. We know from research uh, in the general population that aerobic exercise can be very beneficial for mood and for cardiovascular help, health, um, and uh, so that's important. And we know that uh, exercise helps to manage or reduces the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So lots of reasons to exercise. And of course, you may just enjoy it, which is another reason. Next slide, please. There is anecdotal or limited evidence about uh, the risk to a person with adult Refsum's disease of exercising. So we don't really have any hard and fast evidence about how to change uh, or moderate your physical activity levels uh, in order to reduce the risks uh, that exercise might present to you as a person with adult Refsum's disease. So what we have to do is to take uh, information that we've gleaned um, over the years um, from people with adult Refsum's disease and what's happened when they've uh, started to uh, try a new exercise regime um, and also from uh, some uh, information that we've we've learned uh, from people with other uh, disorders of fatty acid metabolism. So in terms of thinking, first of all, perhaps about general risk um, rather than risk in terms of um, phytanic acid levels. So any exercise uh, does carry a risk of falls or injury. Um, so of course, it's always important to exercise uh, safely and in a safe environment. Um, we do know that some uh, People with adult Refsum's disease have um, perhaps uh, peripheral neuropathy affecting their feet um, where they haven't got normal sensation in their feet and they may have poor blood circulation to their feet. So potentially exercising um, may cause damage uh, to the feet. So making sure that you uh, know whether or not you've got any peripheral neuropathy um, and knowing um, that your your trainers or your shoes are properly fitting um, is is important. And you may um, some people in the past we've found have needed ankle supports, um, and those would be things that you would discuss um, with your with your team. We're also aware that uh, that there is the potential for physical activity to increase the phytanic acid level if um, fat breakdown is, is stimulated during exercise. Or if as a result of exercising and burning more calories, if you like, um, weight loss is generated. So there would be two potential reasons why the phytanic acid level may go up uh, if you exercise and you have adult Refsum's disease. Next slide, please. So this leads us to come up with a few general rules, um, which we hope will, will help you. Um, so the first rule is, is really not to exercise in a fasting state. Uh, so it's important to eat some carbohydrate before you exercise. 
and your dietitian will be able to guide you on the amount of, of carbohydrate that you would be likely to require before exercising. But as a general rule, we would recommend not exercising uh, before you have until you have actually eaten in the day. So for example, going to the gym first thing in the morning before you've had any breakfast wouldn't be recommended. The second general recommendation is to limit the duration of your exercise, so the period of time that you are exercising for, to 45 minutes before you have something else to eat. And again, we would recommend that you focus on refueling specifically with carbohydrate. So that carbohydrate can be in the form of fruit juice, uh, or it can be in the form of a cereal bar, uh, or a biscuit, or a banana. Um, you know, it doesn't, doesn't really matter what the form of the carbohydrate is, is, is um, because that will depend on, on your, um, on the sort of exercise that you're doing, and it will also depend on on your um, plans, whether or not you're planning to exercise more. So we could argue that a good choice before exercise might be a carbohydrate containing food that's a mixture of short acting carbohydrate and a mixture of long acting carbohydrate. So say um, a cereal bar, for example. Whereas during the exercise, um, you might want to have something that's a little bit more quick acting, um, like uh, fruit juice or fruit um, or a glucose drink. Um, after the exercise, um, so you, if you were doing, it's, it's difficult to generalize, but if I think about, if we think about different examples, so one example might be a person who goes to a gym and they like to go to a gym first thing in the morning. So what we might recommend with that person, if they didn't want to physically have breakfast, that they might have, um, they might have a glass of fruit juice before they, they go to the gym or they might have a cereal bar before they go to the gym or a smoothie uh, that contains carbohydrates. So it's got some yogurt or some fruit in it. And then perhaps they might do um, a mixed pro program of exercise in the gym. They might do some stretching exercises and they might do, um, they might want to um, go on a power walker. Um, so you, you might, and that gym session might last for an hour or an hour and a quarter. So then we would recommend taking a break at 45 minutes, refueling perhaps with fruit juice, um, and then carrying on your exercise session before you finish. Um, and then after the exercise session at the next meal, we would recommend that you have a carbohydrate source with the next meal. So for example, we wouldn't recommend having an omelet and a salad uh, after the exercise at the next meal. We would recommend that there would be bread or some other form of carbohydrate with it. If you were planning on taking a different form of exercise, like say you were planning on um, walking um, uh, for a longer period of time, then you might want to have what we would call the drizzle effect of having small amounts of carbohydrate during your walk. So you might start off that you have your breakfast or whichever meal you have before the, uh, before the walk, and then you have the walk and you stop for a breather every 45 minutes and you have something small that contains carbohydrate just to top up. Um, and that form of carbohydrate would vary. It depends on, on um, what uh, is portable for you, what sort of things you like to have um, and what uh, so you might want to go for the fruit juice option. You might want to go for fruit. You might want to have a biscuit. Um, all of those options would be suitable. And then at the end of your walk, again, you would want to have a meal with some carbohydrate in it. So I think those are two reasonable examples to give you. 
Um, looking at general information on metabolism, we we are aware that some forms of exercise generate more lipolysis than other forms of exercise. Um, and some intensities of exercise generate more lipolysis than other forms of exercise. Um, but I think it's probably better to discuss that with your own dietitian and plan out what you are what you are thinking about doing rather than as giving very general rules. Um, and perhaps that might be something that in our question and answer sessions that we're having later on uh, uh, that that this might be something that you might want to ask your more specific questions. And then we would also say that generally in terms of hints and tips that we would recommend that you're aware of the circulation status of your feet and whether or not you have neuropathy um, for the reasons that that we mentioned earlier that you would want to because um, if you have neuropathy and you're exercising um, and your shoes are not fitting properly, then potentially you could damage your feet. And if you have poor circulation in your feet, um, uh, then potentially that that won't heal very well. Um, so that this is is why we would um, suggest that it's important that you're you're aware of your foot health. Um, before you look at embarking on on an exercise regimen. And next slide, please. Thank you.